Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk. Uh, Medicaid benefits is the topic for today, and it's uh, quite a bit of information, so I may go through it a little quickly, but um, you can always go back and watch it again. So we're going to start to talk about the two different types of Medicaid. So there's community or home care Medicaid, and that's the uh, program that covers home health aids for a certain number of hours, depending on the person's needs. Um, and they take care of people who require assistance with their activities of daily living. Then there's institutional Medicaid or chronic care Medicaid, and that covers the cost of a nursing home um, for people who require skilled nursing care services. The home care program, Medicaid home care or community Medicaid, you may hear it referred to, um, is a program that allows for the payment of a home attendant who helps an elderly or disabled person fulfill their basic care needs on a daily basis. So things like bathing and dressing and grooming, um, but in order to qualify, an individual must be both financially eligible and medically eligible. In order to be financially eligible, an individual cannot have more than $14,850 in assets. That is going to include um, any accounts in the bank, checking, savings, money markets, CDs, investment accounts, um, annuities that are um, non-qualified, anything that's not a retirement account. So when looking at somebody's assets, uh, we don't take into consideration an IRA or a 401k or a 403b. Um, we're looking at just their regular um, personal accounts and the total of those cannot be more than $14,850. And for a couple, where they're both applying for Medicaid, cannot be more than $21,750. There's also income allowances. So in order to qualify for community Medicaid, an individual cannot make more than $825 a month, and a couple applying together cannot make more than $1,209 a month total. So most people right off the bat will say, you know, nobody's going to qualify for this benefit. People have more than $14,850 in their accounts, um, and they certainly make more than the $825 a month in income. And when we're talking about income at, you know, the point in somebody's life where they're retired, um, we're talking about Social Security, we're talking about pension, we're talking about uh, distributions from an IRA or a 401k. So those actually do get counted towards the income, even though the principal of the IRA and the 401k aren't counted as a resource, the, uh, the, the distributions that come out are counted as income. In order to qualify for community Medicaid, people can divest themselves of all of their assets and be eligible for Medicaid in the community on the first day of the following month. So basically what that means is if someone has more than the $14,850 in assets, they can essentially move all of that money out of their name today and be eligible for community Medicaid on the first day of December. There's no five-year look-back period for community Medicaid. The five-year look-back only exists in institutional Medicaid situations. So that's one of the biggest pieces of misinformation out there and uh, something that a lot of people don't realize, that there is no five-year look back for home care. So we do spend a lot of our time in our practice um, making people financially eligible for community Medicaid by speaking to them about different ways to transfer their assets to make them eligible. And that's going to be, of course, a topic for um, another one of our webinars. But um, there are many different ways to, to make those transfers, whether it's to an individual or to a trust. You know, there's different ways to do it. Um, but it's important to remember that Medicaid only begins to pay on the first day of the month. So that's why we always try to make sure we get assets transferred prior to the end of a month so that we can start the services immediately. The transfers, again, they can be made to anyone. They can be made to a trust. They can be made to a daughter. They can be made to a son, a spouse, a neighbor, anybody. But what you have to be careful of is just because there's no five-year look back for home care doesn't mean you can just willy-nilly transfer the assets. You need to do it strategically because if the individual needs a nursing home within five years of having made those transfers for home care benefit purposes, then we're going to need that money to come back. So we never want to put the money 
um, in a vulnerable situation. And again, that's another topic about transferring assets and the best way to do that, but we always want to make sure that we're doing it the right way. The majority of obstacles faced when applying for um, for institutional Medicaid has to do with the resource allowance, the asset transfer penalties, and the five-year look back. So remember, we first talked about um, home care Medicaid and qualifying and making yourself eligible and moving money and no five-year look back. And now we're talking about institutional Medicaid and the obstacles involved because there is a five-year look back. So in order to qualify for institutional Medicaid, again, an individual cannot make more than $14,850, cannot have more, I'm sorry, than $14,850 in assets. If that person is married, the spouse in the community cannot have more than $120,900 in assets. The income allowance is also different for institutional Medicaid. An individual who's receiving Medicaid benefits in a nursing home they get to keep $50 a month of their income just for certain things that they might need in the nursing home. And the community spouse, if there is one, they're allowed to make $3,022.50. If they don't make that in income every month, they can take income from the institutionalized spouse to bring them to that number. Going back to income with home care Medicaid, now we're going to talk about income, is that if an individual has more than the $825 in income, um, they can still qualify for Medicaid. What used to happen is that people would have to spend down their excess income on their care. So anything over the $825, they'd have to pay for their care, and then Medicaid would pick up the difference but that was forcing people to live on the $825 a month to pay all of their household expenses, which clearly was not working. So now what they do is they allow us to set up something called a pooled income trust. And a pooled income trust is a special sort of trust that serves as an alternative to the old spend down, which again was paying for care and then Medicaid picking up the difference. And the pooled income trust is set up through a not-for-profit charitable organization. There's many, many of them all over Long Island. And basically, the, the participants, who are typically people who are on community Medicaid, contribute their excess income every month to the trust, and it gets managed by the trust administrators. But that money is still earmarked for the person who's on Medicaid. So if an individual has $2,000 more than the $825 and they send that $2,000 to the pooled income trust every month, that's going to be earmarked for that individual. And that money can then be used to pay for that individual's living expenses, mortgage payments, or rent, or food and utilities, recreational activities. So the pooled income trust is great uh, because it allows people to uh, continue to have access to all of their monthly income, even if they're on Medicaid in the community and Medicaid is paying for their home health aides. Um, the disbursements from the trust have to be paid directly to the provider of the service. So many people will use a credit card for their regular monthly expenses and then submit the credit card bill to the pooled trust because they will pay the credit card company directly. Um, with other things like rent or mortgage, then you just send the statement or the bill to the pooled income trust and they'll pay directly. One of the only things to kind of keep in mind about the pooled income trust is that um, if money builds up in the pooled income trust as time goes on, so if this person with $2,000 more than the 825 puts you know, 2000 in every month and doesn't use it every month, it can carry over from month to month. But if there is money sitting in there when the person passes away, that's going to go to the not-for-profit to further their purpose. So for community Medicaid, once we've gotten somebody below the $14,850 in assets and we've set up their pooled income trust if they have more than $825 in income, now we have to make sure that they're medically eligible. And that involves a number of different assessments that are done both by the state and also by a managed long-term care company that gets involved at that point um, as a middleman between the Department of Social Services 
and the person who is applying for Medicaid benefits. When they come in to do the assessment, they're going to look again at these activities of daily living, toileting, mobility, transferring, feeding, dressing, grooming, and turning and positioning. So basically, the assessor is going to come in and ask the individual who is applying for Medicaid to do certain things or whether they can do certain things. And depending on what they can and cannot do, the assessor is going to determine how many hours Medicaid is going to cover for the care of this individual in their home. Important thing to remember is you can supplement hours of care without interfering with your Medicaid benefits. So um, if somebody is given, say, 12 hours of care and the family believes that they need someone there full time, they can supplement the difference and it doesn't affect the Medicaid benefits. The change in need is what occurs when somebody is at home, they're, in, they're on community Medicaid, they have a home health aid, and something happens and their needs can no longer be met at home. This will typically happen if there's a fall or some other sort of injury and the person goes to the hospital, the hospital feels maybe they're not ready to go home, so they send them to rehab. And then from rehab, it's determined that uh, it's not safe for them to go home. So we call that a change in need, and that's a form that has to be completed. And we submit to the Department of Social Services and say this individual is already covered under the community Medicaid program, but now we need to convert those benefits to institutional. And this is what I mean by saying you have to be careful with where you're transferring money to qualify for community Medicaid because you could have you know, scattered money all over amongst your children and now before the five years pass, there's a change in need, we need to get that money back. And that's where we come to um, dealing with the look back period. And there's always a lot of confusion between the look back period and the penalty period. The look back period for Medicaid is five years. It's five years for everybody, it's always five years. The penalty period is going to be different for everybody. The penalty period is based on how much money an individual has given away over the five-year look-back period and doing a calculation to determine how long of a penalty period will be, um, will be put into place because of those transfers. So how long will the Medicaid applicant be ineligible for Medicaid because of those transfers? So how do we figure that out? It's, um, it's, a, it's a calculation. Um, you'll see on the slides that there's some numbers there. In Long Island, there's a regional rate of $12,811 a month. And in New York City in the boroughs, it's $12,157. The regional rate, those are figures that are given to us by the Department of Health every year. They're supposed to represent the average cost of a nursing home in the area. Um, so the numbers are pretty low here. It, the average cost of a nursing home on Long Island is probably somewhere between fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars a month. So that the numbers they give us at Department of Health are pretty low, but they're the ones that we need to use. So in order to determine the penalty period, we look at the five-year look back. So we get five years of statements. We make a list of all the transactions that were gifts that took place or uncompensated transfers. We add them up and we divide them by the regional rate. And that answer is the number of months a person is ineligible for Medicaid benefits. So a quick case study, we have Mrs. Smith who has a total of $159,000 in assets. She's totally fine. And she transfers $99,000 to her children in November of 2014 for a down payment on a house. And she keeps $60,000 in her name. Now, to do the calculations here, we're going to assume the regional rate's $11,000 a month. Uh, Mrs. Smith suffers a stroke one year later in November of 2015, so one year after she gave the money away, and she goes to a nursing home. So now when we look at the five years going back, we're going to see that $99,000 gift. So the first thing that has to happen when we look at this picture is Mrs. Smith needs to spend down her $60,000 because even if I can calculate the penalty, okay, which is $99,000 divided by 11,000, which is the regional rate in this example, which is nine months penalty, 
even though I can calculate it, it doesn't start to run until Mrs. Smith has less than $14,850 in her name. So she's going to spend down her $60,000, which is going to take her through April of 2016. She's going to pay the nursing home privately. And then her nine-month penalty can begin to run. So that's going to take her out to January of 2017. February 1st, 2017, she would then be eligible for Medicaid. But there's no money to cover those nine months because remember, 99000 went to the kids to put a down payment on a house, so there's no way to get that money back, potentially. Um, and the 60000 that she had in her name, she had to spend down in order to even start the penalty period. So these are the concerns, and these are the, the, this is the time when we become concerned with, well, what's going to happen to her? The nursing home knows there's no payment source. So, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, they're going to put my mom on the street. Obviously, they're not going to put mom on the street, but they will send mom out to the hospital if mom is not feeling well and maybe not, you know, have her welcome her back in. So the hospital has to find another facility for her to go to. So it, it can become quite, uh, quite difficult. Now, there are ways to navigate all of this and try to find money in other places or perhaps have the kids take a mortgage to give some of the money back. And there are different uh, creative strategies that we can uh, come up with to, to solve these types of problems. But this is just an example of how something so innocent can cause a huge problem if someone becomes ill. Um, you know, I guess no, none of us ever plan, but before, you know, before they, they expect that they will. So uh, the takeaway from this is to plan early, uh, transfer assets to trusts, which again, we're going to talk about on another webinar, but make asset transfers as soon as possible. We typically recommend that our clients start thinking about at least setting up a trust and transferring their family home as early as the age of 55, because you want that five years to come and go without any issue at all. Um, that's the safest way to do it to make sure that everything can be protected. Again, um, TALK, Tools and Advice for Working Caregivers, is a program offered by our firm, Genzer Dubau, Genzer and Kona. It is an employee benefit program. Um, elder care is the new child care. Many people are working elder caregivers that are juggling their full-time jobs and taking care of an aging parent or a loved one. And these webinars are in place to help educate you and help you navigate the elder care landscape. Uh, there are other um, benefits available for any company that uh, is interested in learning more about TALK. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, once again, we say uh, employers who arm their workforce with the knowledge of, of what they need to know for elder law will position themselves as a thought leader in their industry, offering cutting edge benefits. And assisting employees in navigating the elder care landscape will decrease absenteeism, downtime, and turnover by keeping your elder caregivers present and productive at work. And we see this all the time because when we meet with adult children who are taking care of their parents, their primary concern about what they're, taking, what they're doing um, is that they're going to miss a lot of time from work. So this can certainly help. And uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.